Well, I am honored to speak with you. You're a Peabody and DuPont award-winning journalist, and you're very impressive when we watch this new show, Trafficked, um, on National oh, Geographic. Yeah. And you're brave. I mean, you go into the belly of the beast. La boca del lugo. Yeah. Lobo. <laughs> the episode that I, that I saw, the one with the drug trafficking, you go from the very bottom to the mule who takes anything from firearms to drugs across the border to Mexico. How do you get these people to talk to you? I mean, because they're putting their life in peril, not only, not only with law enforcement, but with their bosses. Well, there's always a permission of the boss. Nothing gets done, especially in Mexico and especially in Sinaloa without the permission of the boss. Um, I think it's a combination of factors. I think that on the one hand, it's uh, ego plays into it. Um, I think it's an opportunity for many people who are very good at what they do, um, whether, we, whether we agree with it or not. Um, they, they're sort of the best at what they do, whether it's packing or, or making the drugs or making fake US dollars or scamming people. And many times their families don't even know they do this. Uh, so this is an opportunity for them to, in disguise, sort of talk about what they're really good at, what they're passionate about and what they've been doing for many years. On the other hand, I also think that there's an opportunity for people who are the most stigmatized and stereotyped people in our society to uh, be listened to and to be understood. And I think there's a need to show that they're not bad people. They wanna show us and show me in this case, you know, how they got into this world um, and how, again, how they're not bad people. I think that's very important. And on, on the third thing I would say is that a lot of times it's just, it's, it's also a power, um, a power move on their part, um, especially in Mexico when there are other cartels and rival groups involved, there's sort of a need to show, uh, you know, to show off their weapons and their big drug operations. Um, so it's a combination of those things. And I'm sure it doesn't hurt when they say this award-winning journalist wants to come, and that plays into the ego, right? Absolutely. And the fact that it's National Geographic, that there's an American channel with a brand that's recognized all over the world that's coming into their world and interested and curious about what they're doing. Um, I think that always plays a part. And what's interesting about your show and a lot of shows that we see out there is that it basically examines like what, like you mentioned, what gets them into this trade. And it's basically economic reasons. Like they have no other choice. They have no other way of making money. And this Absolutely. is, you know. The vast majority of times. Um, I mean, again, we can judge them and, 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 con and, and condemn them all our lives and see them as the others and the criminals. Um, but at the end of the day, it's not until we actually listen to them, understand them, and address what leads them into these worlds, is anything going to change? Uh, imprisoning people, as we've seen, mass incarceration in America is not helping, and certainly not helping in the, 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 the war. The war on drugs is certainly not helped either. Um, so, so I think it's so much more important to approach these worlds and these people with, with, under, with trying to understand them than it is, again, with, with judgment. Um, and yes, a million percent, I'd say, you know, over 90% of the people I interview, ultimately, it's always about lack of opportunities. I mean, I remember this one case that will always stay with me, where we interview this, these uh, mochileros, these essentially teenagers who hike for days on end from uh, the, the frame in Peru and carry massive amounts of illegal, of cocaine on their backs, the cocaine that's going to, to come to the United States eventually. And it's incredibly dangerous and hard work. And, and, you know, they've seen friends being killed by rival groups in this area. And I remember asking this one kid, you know, why do you do it? And he said, look, I grew up always wanting to go to college, always, I wanted to be a dentist. My family is very, very poor. They don't have money to afford to pay for my college. And I knew the only way I could save money was by, by doing this work, and I do. And I said, well, why do you want to go to college? Why do you want to be a dentist, essentially? And he said, because I want to make people smile. Mm, yeah. um, big smiles and that that's a story that will always stay with me and I really do hope that these are the stories that sort of viewers will take in when they watch traffic I, I, I hope that it's not just the danger because it is it's it's dangerous it's adventurous it's compelling it's it's crazy but uh but there's also a lot of humanizing and heart um and soul in it and I hope that's that's more of the takeaway yeah one of the mules she's a mom and she's an everyday you're talking or we don't see her face obviously but she's a regular person and she does it for, you know, to make money and she makes $20,000 each run. It's like, whoa, like who wouldn't be enticed by that? If you're so desperate. 
poor grew up in a poor family, not many opportunities. She's actually American, an American citizen, and uh, started seeing people surrounding. She started seeing around her people like her age making a lot of money, and immediately, you know, as 16, 17 years old, she started getting interested and asking around and realized, wait, I can make this amount of money just by driving down to Mexico and back to the US. And, and she started doing it. And she was pregnant at the time that we filmed with her. She's carrying a bag, of, you know, a, a trunk full of uh, fentanyl in her car. Wow, just amazing. Yeah, these stories are, are really amazing. And you cover a wide variety of illegal um, activity, like drug, I mean, obviously drugs, tigers, like nobody really covers that anymore. You used to hear about it all the time. Um, counterfeit money, sex, firearms, steroids. Like there's, a, I guess, steroids because they are um, restricted here in the U.S., so they have to import yeah. import steroids. Yeah, absolutely. It's illegal to purchase steroids unless they're prescribed by your doctor, essentially. And yet, they are widely uh, used more and more. I mean, for the steroids episode, we even spoke to suburban moms who take steroids. Um, people who go, before they go out, they go on vacation, um, take steroids. Wow. It's sort of a fast, easy, not very expensive way of looking incredible uh, without doing much work at all. Um, but I, I think many times in that enticement, people forget sort of the dangers um, that come associated with it. Um, well, you shot this before the pandemic, but how do you think now, because steroids are the, like the cure for the treatment? You know, one thing I found with the pandemic that I wasn't expecting, I, we started filming again season two back in June, July. And um, I wasn't sure the world had changed so much just in those few months when, since the pandemic started that I wasn't sure what I was going to find. And actually what I found is that there has been an explosion of black markets around the world. Um, it is exactly at moments when there's an economic downturn that mm -hmm. people turn to black markets um, because they've lost their jobs, because they have to figure out a way to bring money back to their families. Um, and, and they eventually turn to black markets. And I, we've seen it with drug trafficking, we've seen it with sex trafficking. Um, I mean, you name it, and scams, for example, you name it and it's out there. So we realized pretty, pretty soon after we started going out in the field that this was more, more than ever an important moment to be covering these subject matters. Wow, and so how do you go about, I know we met a few of your, con we meet a few of your contacts um, to um, these different groups. But how do you initiate that? How do you, you mean, you have to build up trust. I mean, that's just so complicated. How do you even, I mean, how many months does that take before you even start filming and getting access? Yeah, years sometimes even, you know, a lot of the contacts that uh, we, we got, for example, for the fentanyl episode, I've been covering the opioid epidemic since 2008. So it's many times it's months and sometimes even years of, uh, of contact building and trust building with, with networks and, you know, criminal groups around the world. Um, but a lot of times it's also uh, the work of the local journalists who have been covering. I think one thing we don't usually, we're, we're not aware of is how important local journalists are to the work that we do and how they really are the brave ones because they're the ones who are reporting on the, these, these stories and, uh, and have to stay in the country after we leave. Um, yeah really they truly are really the brave ones um and i do think that the work they, they do and the work of journalism in general is more important now than than ever you know when journalists in mexico for example are being killed where they're being silenced in the philippines and and called fake news in the united states um mm -hmm. more than ever journalists journalism is important and again uh we we depend on the bravery of these local journalists more more than us <laughs> now more. When you agree, um, when they agree, do they have like, do, oh, they probably don't know about final edits, you know, they don't know about that stuff, right? No, but we, I'll tell you, we, they, they mask themselves up before we start. We take a photo and show them exactly what they look like. There are many rules of engagement where they tell us what we can and cannot film to mm -hmm. protect their, themselves and to protect our sources. And at the end, we always show the local journalist, again, because he's the one who could suffer most yeah. We also always show the local journalist what it looks like um, for safety purposes. Yeah, it's good because I was thinking like uh, their life is in your hands, you know, because some sensationalist might say, oh, I got a scoop, I'm going to show it, but now you're putting at risk your local contact. Absolutely. And, and, you know, because I've been working in these worlds and with people, with these people for so long, many times they're not just people, colleagues, they're you know, they're very close friends. My 
fixer here in Miguel, in uh, Culiacan in uh, Mexico is Miguel Angel Vega, who's one of my closest friends. He's almost part of my family. So we take that very, very seriously, their, their safety very seriously. Now in these episodes, what is like the most shocking thing you learned that even took you aback? Like, oh, wow, I've never seen this in my professional career. The prevalence and how out in the open these networks operate. Uh, mm. That was something that I was not aware of at all and how, how, how they're everywhere. Um, you know, a lot of the, uh, many of the scenes we filmed for season one actually happened within 10, 15 minute drive from my home in Los Angeles. Um, oh. That blew my mind. I had no idea. And out in the open, I mean, we, we filmed a, a, a gun deal happening, um, again, 15 minutes from my house uh, at 9 or 10 p.m. on a weeknight, uh, right next to a major freeway in L.A., out on the streets where they were hiding AK-47s and AR-15s into the trunk of a car. And wow. it was happening without them even trying to hide it. Um, so I think that truly shocked me and continues to shock me. And yeah, what a lot of people don't realize is that the American firearms, that's what's prevalent in Mexico. They all come from America. I mean, they don't know that America is part of the problem and nobody always, they always put it on the Latin American countries, but they never turn in and say, look, it's our problem. We transport these you know, firearms yeah, out. There's actually a saying in Mexico uh, that I think can be, you can put it anywhere in Latin America, actually, where there is violence, gun violence. Um, the large majority of the guns come from the U.S. And there's a saying in Mexico, which is, uh, the Americans provide the guns, we provide the corpses. Um, but America has become the supermarket of guns for the world, essentially. I mean, certainly for Latin America, um, for Central and South America. Yeah, I mean, I've reported on guns in, in as far down as Brazil, and uh, where a lot of the guns, the majority of the guns are coming from the United States as well. Now, does it ever happen when law enforcement comes to you and wants to get information from me? Oh, they pretty much know that all journalists are hands off and they're never going to divulge their... Secrets. It's happened. We've been approached and asked to share raw tapes, um, but we don't. I mean, we take you know our, our protection of our sources very, very, very seriously. But it's definitely happened where they come and they want to know. Um, but that's not our job. You know, we're not law enforcement. We're there to witness and to report and to bring back uh, and show our audience what we have seen. Um, and hopefully, with that, um, you know, we'll be able to deal with it and address what's happening in these worlds better. But our, our job is not to do, um, it's not, we're not law enforcement. Yeah, and there's a few close calls with you uh, on the show. I mean, what's the craziest story you have about fearing for your life? Uh, there, were, there, were, there were a bunch. I mean, there was a moment, for example, when we were filming the guns episode where we were going into sort of the foothills of the Sierra Madres here in, in Sinaloa and with these armed men, they are sicarios. And they told us, you know, we are, you're safe with us, you're protected while you're in our territory. But if the Marines, the, Mexi the feared Mexican Marines show up, then there's gonna be a firefight and you're gonna be caught in the middle and there's nothing we can do to protect you. And of course, a couple of hours later, their walkie talkie start buzzing and we know something's up and they turned to us and said, we're, at, we're effed, we're screwed. Uh, the Marines are here. There's a helicopter coming towards us. We have to get out of here immediately. And you know, there's a moment where we run to our car and then we're trying to figure out what do we do now? If we start driving off, uh, they'll see us, we'll be in an open field. If we try to hide, it will look suspicious where we don't have anything to hide ourselves as journalists. So it was a really difficult moment. Um, and I'm not gonna tell you what happened next. You have to see the episode, but, um, but it was definitely a close call. Yeah, that was definitely a nail biter. I was like, I don't know how this person does this. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, I mean, it's a and that's just one. I think. I think in every episode, almost every episode we did, there were moments like that. There were holy, what, what we call holy shit moments, for sure. And my last question: What motivates you to do this? Because, like you, you know, we mentioned, we're talking about there's some serious, dangerous um, situations. Yeah. What motivates Absolutely. you? I think two two important things that I want to uh, come out of this show. One is, I think. You know, we are not aware of how important and how much of a role these informal markets play in the world and how they impact us on a daily basis. Uh, you know, the formal economy is heavily studied. We know every up and down, twist and turn, everything that happens with the formal economy, right? The informal economy makes up for almost half of the global economy, and we know very little about it. So to me, it's, I think it's, I'm, I'm drawn to show this world that's hidden, that's dark, and that uh, you know, few, few people get access to. Um, on the other hand, I, I do think it's very important for me, one of the biggest goals is to not 
portray the world as black and white, as us versus them, and to humanize the people that we're talking with and who are opening up our, their lives to us, and to show that a lot of times they are a lot more like us than we like to believe. You know, they're, they have kids, they have uh, uh, wives and mothers and fathers, and ultimately, um, whether we like it or not, they're a lot more similar to us. Um, and so humanizing them is very important. And I think, again, really only by understanding what lets, leads a person into this life and the lack of opportunities that exist uh, can we address these matters and, and stop these global trafficking networks. Yeah, I mean, you really see it through the mask, the eyes, like the innocence behind it. You know, when they're talking, they're just like normal people and they're like, you know, it's, it's a window through their soul. It's like, they're just, not like in the movie where you see the villains, they always have this mean look. And oh, it's yeah, not yeah. like that. It's like, so not like it's innocent so not eyes. Like, yeah, it's so not like that. That doesn't mean that there aren't bad people out there. There are. Yeah. Um, but, and that's always sort of a moral dilemma to me, knowing that I, I'm empathizing and, 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 and I really want to sort of try to walk in their shoes and understand them. But at the, on the other hand, I do have to keep on questioning the impacts and the, sort of the negative impact that they have in the world and the work they did they're doing have in the world. Because I know, for example, the drugs that they're trafficking, the drugs that they're making, you know, are killing people. The, the women that they're trafficking are harming people. You know, the, the fake dollars are having an impact on people's daily lives. So it's, it's always a, a sort of a balance of the two. Yeah. Well, I will say not the sex trafficking. That's just, just not, that's not forgivable at all. I mean, that's just horrible. It's, when you're, it's I mean, one of the human, hardest that to do. Yeah. Human trafficking, you can't forgive. Empathize with sex traffickers was really hard, but I'd love for you to watch the episode. And, okay. And I'll watch it. Yeah. Talk of what you think of them. Yeah. Well, the first step is the two episodes that I saw, you're doing great work. I admire what you're doing. You're very brave <laughs> to Thank go out so there and do this and report to the rest of us to inform us what's going on in the world. Thank you so much. Uh, really thank you, Mariana. Thank you, Lupe.